All right, we can get uh, started. Hello again, and uh, thank you so much for joining this uh, webinar. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to walk you through um, results from a bioprocessing survey that we conducted here at GFI from last year. And the report will come out shortly and will be available uh, online. And we'll actually send you a link to the full report uh, to the email uh, with which you sign up for the webinar. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Good Food Institute, GFI is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we are developing a roadmap for a sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. Uh, we are 100% backed by philanthropy, and I want to take a second and thank our uh, generous donors that allow us to do what we do. In GFI, we have about 200 members worldwide, and we focus on three key areas. Um, the first one is the science and technology team, which is the team Elliot and I are a part of. Um, our job is to advance fundamental open access research in all proteins. Uh, we also have a corporate engagement team that partners with companies and investors to drive investment, accelerate innovation, and scale the supply chain. And lastly, we have the policy team that advocates for fair policy and public research funding for all proteins. All right, let's start with some background information about the survey and details about the study design and participants. And for the purpose of this webinar and um, the full report that will be published every time, we mention tons, uh, we mean metric ton. If only everyone used SI units, I didn't need to make this announcement. <laughs> right. Um, so our goal with this survey was to really understand the current and future capacities in cultivated meat manufacturing, as well as understanding the scaling strategies that companies are using and the overall trend in um, um, the overall trend in uh, just equipment and material that people are using uh, for cultivated meat in the near future. We also wanted the survey to inform investors as well as suppliers so they can be prepared to meet the demands for cultivated meat industry in the coming years. Now, as you can see, we had 30 respondents to the survey and 20 of them were from cultivated meat and seafood manufacturing uh, companies and six of them were from cultivated meat equipment providers. And we also had other participants from different backgrounds, for instance, from CDMOs or contact manufacturers and uh, from R&D facilities um, and things like that. The data uh, from the survey gives us a baseline for understanding where the industry is at and where it is going um, in the coming years. It also informs us here at GFI on what to be tracking over time. I really will also want to emphasize that the data that we are presenting today are not projections or estimates by GFI. Um, we are just reporting the uh, survey data. In terms of the cell lines, um, as you can see, most of the companies work with mammalian and avian cell lines, so 15 and 13 accordingly. And we also had 11 companies that work with fish and invertebrate cell lines. So part of the reason that you're gonna see variations in, in basically the data, data that was reported from companies um, could be due to the different types of cell lines that companies are using. So we noticed that uh, different companies use different terminologies to refer to their production capacity and the scale of manufacturing. So at the beginning of the survey, we decided to uh, prepare a guide to um, basically guide the industry. So the, the guide itself was informed by the industry um, in order to really unify the terminologies. And what do I mean by that? So we realized that, uh, you know, different companies refer to the same process with different terminologies. Uh, someone might call it uh, industrial scale. Someone else calls the same thing. Um, commodity scale, someone would call it pilot scale. And we realized there is no consistency um, or clear definition here, which is the point of this part. Um, so this uh, figure will be live on our website and um, you're gonna also find it in the survey. We do encourage cultivated meat stakeholders to use this guide in categorizing their process. Um, so before actually uh, making this graph, we asked cultivated meat companies, how do you define the scale of 
your process? What are the terminologies that you even use? And we realized that different companies use different terminologies and even the definitions were different or the criteria they would use in order to uh, you know, define their uh, process and choose this terminology. Everything was very different. So um, we prepared this guide and uh, just to give you an example, what we are suggesting is for instance, if the scale of production is a couple of liters, which results in a couple of grams of cultivated meat, that would be R&D scale. If it's tens of liters of culture that produces a few kilograms of cultivated meat, that would be bench scale and so on. Um, so please note that this is based on cumulative data from cultivated meat companies. And the biomass here, which is either the gram, kilogram or tons, um, it's not really a direct conversion from the bioreactor volume because that would depend on the yield of process and the yield itself is dependent on so many different factors such as mode of operation, cell type, et cetera. But the amount of meat produced is based on the total culture volume in one production cycle, which can involve multiple bioreactors with varying volumes. Um, this graph for sure isn't really a universal fit for all solution, um, but it is uh, helpful to get everyone on the same page. So we do encourage people to use it. So moving on in this section, we will explore the current and future facilities and production capacities. So towards the beginning of the survey, we'd ask a lot of questions about facilities construction, um, such as the state of facility prior to construction, was it an existing warehouse or was it a greenfield, et cetera. The time that it took to uh, construct the facility and the time to reach full capacity and more questions like that. Um, as you can see, there is a strong preference for turning existing warehouses or shell only uh, to cultivated meat facilities. But as you can see, there are also other companies that use uh, existing facility with interior equipment and utilities, which can reduce the time to reach full capacity. Now, depending on the state of facility prior to construction, the construction time can change and be in a range of you know, a couple of months to a couple of years. But we do wanna uh, encourage companies to consider and plan for unexpected delays. Um, in one of the pharmaceutical companies that I used to work at, uh, I remember we were trying to expand and um, I remember the contractor said that it's gonna take one year to fully build the you know, uh, second facility. And I remember the head of facility said, okay, so two years. Um, and it didn't take that long for me to realize why he multiplied that number by two. Uh, just because I realized that when they were trying to get up some bushes in order to extend the facility, they had to wait for the city to show up and give permits and there were delays. Um, so there were like so many just unnecessary and unexpected delays. So we do encourage both entrepreneurs and investors to really expect um, these delays in, con in construction of new facilities. The next important question was to really understand companies project uh, projected production volumes by the end of 2023 and 2026. So in 2023, as you can see, um, the production volumes were mostly in the order of kilo, uh, kilograms because they're in the bench scale or pre-pilot scale. But we did also have a few companies in pilot or industrialized uh, scale. By the end of 2026, um, as you can see, there is definitely a shift towards tens or even hundreds of tons of cultivated meat production. And that's largely because larger production facilities are expected to become operational, which will significantly increase the cultivated meat production capacity. Now, 19 companies responded to our question about estimated production and maximum capacity by the end of 2026. From these 19 companies combined, uh, they projected to produce 25,000 tons of cultivated meat by the end of 2026. And this is shown in the right bar on that uh, graph. And the bars are col color coded based on optimistic versus conservative estimates. Now, this is really based on limited data. And so please be aware of the limitations, especially if they refer to future production capacities. Uh, these projections really don't account for potential uh, innovations and improvements 
or new industry players that can significantly change the equation um, when it comes to future production capacity. Now, assuming these uh, 19 respondents um, sort of represent the 100 global B2C companies, um, we can extrapolate from the reported 25,000 tons by multiplying that by a factor of five to account for um, all global cultivated meat companies. Now, so that we have some ideas of what these numbers mean. Um, in 2021, McKinsey published a report that suggested that cultivated meat market could achieve between 1,000 to 75,000 tons of production by 2025. Um, so again, our report was what 25,000 tons from 19 companies by the end of 2026. Um, McKinsey's estimate is all cultivated meat companies um, by 2025. Um, McKinsey also predicts that cultivated meat production could increase to between 400,000 tons to 2.1 million tons by 2030, depending on the different um, growth scenarios. Now, to put these numbers in perspective, um, on the left figure, you can see that um, dashed line that repre represents the average US slaughterhouse production. So again, the average estimate for 2026 um, of these 19 companies combined was 25,000 tons. The average US slaughterhouse production is about 32,000 uh, tons. So just, just, you know how much these numbers, what they really mean. Um, and just to be clear, these are very large slaughterhouses in the U.S., 95% of meat comes from 800 USDA-regulated uh, slaughterhouses, which is where this number comes from. So moving on, we asked uh, questions about bioreactor sizes that cultivated meat companies are using or planning to use in the near future. Um, the most commonly mentioned size was between 10,000 to 50,000 liter bioreactors mentioned by uh, five companies. Um, and for the reference, uh, 40,000 liter is one of the largest reactor sizes used in biopharma uh, to our knowledge. And it's a 40,000 liter bioreactor with 30,000 liter working volume. So in general, cultivated meat is expected to be more sustainable and uh, use less land and cause less pollution than conventional meat, um, which is sort of the whole point, right? When it comes to the amount of emissions and water used, however, it also depends on the source of energy and the other practices such as recycling. Some companies said that they're installing renewable energy sources as their primary energy supply. One company even said that they're aiming for carbon and water neutrality using solar energy and water recycling. Other companies uh, said that they would use just a standard energy mix, but majority of them said that they're interested in renewable energy and want to supplement their energy source with renewables. But they also mentioned other factors for improving sustainability. For instance, co-localizing their production facility with uh, uh, media processing facilities or focusing on sustainability in facility design and construction. So antibiotics um, and media sterilization, these are both uh, important factors that can impact both safety and consumer perception. So we asked a series of questions about sterility practices and antibiotic use. Um, in terms of how companies sterilize the media, majority of them said that they use 0.2 micron filters. Um, the rest of them use other equipment, for instance, 0.1 micron filters or irradiations. Um, just want to be very clear that these filters are very common. Uh, in fact, I just happen to have two of them sitting at my desk. This is 0.1 and this is 0.2 micron filters, and I use them for just microscopy, and you can buy them from Amazon. Really important that these are actually very simple and the material to use this, uh, to make these filters, uh, it's not actually that expensive. Uh, but for biopharma, uh, the same thing uh, is put inside bigger capsules uh, for larger volumes, of course. And those capsules, just each of them can cost anywhere between hundreds to sometimes thousands of dollars. And you use them once and you toss them. And you might even use a bunch of them in a small, relatively small process. So 
we're going to talk about this uh, in in the coming slides that we really think that there is opportunity to make um, fit for purpose material for cultivated meat. But in any case, um, you can see that 0.2 uh, micron filters are the most common way to sterilize the media. Um, in terms of um, using antibiotics and anti <clears throat> antimycotics, <clears throat> Most companies said that they don't use it or they use it exclusively during pre-production. <clears throat> so that's like cell line development or cell banking. A few companies said that they use antibiotics or antimycotics <clears throat> during pre-production and production. But what we think is that by production, what they mean is just scaling up from small R&D phase to pilot phase. So they're not really talking about uh, commercial and commodity scales. So basically the take home message here is that many cultivated meat companies are not planning on using antibiotics in commercial or production scale. Um, so we also ask other questions, open-ended questions about contaminations and how to manage contamination. And here are some of the learnings from the survey. So contamination sources can be managed at the entry point. And we can actually learn a lot from practices in both food and pharma sectors. Pharma has actually demonstrated that it's 100% possible to grow cells in larger scales without antibiotics. And again, to share a personal experience, um, one of the companies I worked at, we were producing uh, monoclonal antibodies and I was doing a pilot study and the whole point was not to produce stuff for injection, but just to test the new media and the efficiency of the media in um, uh, increasing the protein concentration or uh, antibody titer. And uh, I remember it was a very rushed study and at the time we didn't have room inside of our clean room. So we had to put the bioreactors inside the office space. So we had two 50 liter bioreactors that I was using and I did cell culture, 50 liters each, side by side for 30 days inside basically office space. And without antibiotics, with multiple injections and sampling uh, every single day, I managed to have this project completed without contamination. It's not something that I recommend that we should be doing, but I'm, I'm saying that it is 100% possible to grow these cells, um, even when the environment is not sterile, as long as all the entry points um, are sterile and um, perfectly sealed. Um, the contamination rate actually in pharma is rather low. The average interval between batch failure is once every 58 weeks. And only 3% of these uh, batch failures uh, are due to contamination. Now for cultivated meat, the challenge is really to do this in a more cost-effective way while ensuring safety uh, without relying on antibiotics. I also wanna say that suppliers really have to make sure that they provide high quality raw materials and equipment to minimize the risk of contamination. And there is also here, uh, a big potential for R&D here to address contamination with innovative approaches such as antimicrobial peptides. So peptides are tiny proteins, if you will, um, and they're not uh, the same thing as antibiotics. So they would basically, uh, go away or become inactive during processing, unlike antibiotics. So another important question that we always get is the use of serum um, in media for cultivated meat. Our survey um, shows that most cultivated meat companies uh, are actively developing serum replacements. And two of them actually use commercially available serum alternatives. Alternatives could be based on recombinant proteins or they can be uh, plant-based or fungal or algae-based. There is definitely a significant market and need for commercially available and cost-effective serum replacements. And companies can actually provide cell-specific um, animal-free media for other cultivated meat companies and basically license, license it to them. Um, these findings actually align with a previous study conducted here at GFI, which found that 64% of uh, surveyed companies had adapted at least one cell line to serum-free conditions. So that's definitely good news for the industry. But there is definitely more work need to be done, especially as uh, most companies don't share their recipes. So everyone has to sort of 
um, reinvent the wheel um, and work independently. All right, so let's talk about yield and proliferation. Yield is definitely one of the most important factors as it directly relates to the amount of biomass or meat that is produced. Yield in cell culture can depend on so many factors itself, such as bioprocessing design, cell type, media efficiency, the type of bioreactors, and other factors. So we asked cultivated meat companies about their production yield. And as you can see, results vary significantly, anywhere from five to 10 grams per liter to uh, you know, 100, 200, or 360 gram per liter. And one reason for this diversity in responses is because companies employ uh, very different bioprocessing techniques, production scales, um, and um, other things. Then that's why the data is so uh, uh, different. Um, so because of that, it's sort of difficult to predict an industry-wide yield, uh, but there are two published data uh, on this figure that you can see, uh, the 150 gram per, per liter and the 360 gram per liter. Um, the 150 gram per liter is a, um, that's an estimated industry average by 2030, and it's from a published study, and it falls sort of in the middle of the range that uh, the data that we collected. And the other uh, published number is that 360 gram per liter at the end, which was achieved in a two liter bioreactor with high perfusion rate. So we'll cover this uh, later, but high perfusion rate means that it allows reaching much higher densities compared to other modes of operation. So what that means is that that number or um, you know, results from that number may not necessarily be applicable to other data. Uh, but I think it's good to know that these experimental data exist and these yields are for sure achievable. Again, we really encourage caution in interpreting the data here. It's based on limited data. And we also don't know anything else about the scale, the cell type and mode of operation and how companies really uh, got to these numbers. Um, so please be careful using this data. But I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, these, uh, so just tracking yield, uh, I think it's a good measure to look at the progress of cultivated meat. And uh, we really want to be tracking this data in GFI as data becomes available. Now, when it comes to uh, growing cells and proliferation, there are many ways to go about this, depending on the cell type and whether we want proliferation or differentiation and the end product. Is the end product meatball, a sausage, or is it steak and um, you know, possibly needs more structure and texture and you know, scaffolding? So based on the data we collected, single cell suspension is the most common method, but you can also see adherence to microcarriers, growth in aggregates, and uh, adherence to scaffolding to be uh, common as well. Um, this data really represents um, many different companies in different stages of production. So some of them could be smaller and some of them could be more mature companies, which is why in this case, I uh, also looked at companies that produce more than 100 kilograms uh, in, or produced more than 100 kilograms in 2023, and that favored towards single cell suspension and growth in aggregates. So harvesting is obviously an important step after your cell culture. Typically, harvesting is not a huge deal for biopharma, but for cultivated meat, it's a big deal. In biopharma, oftentimes when you use mammalian cells, it's in order to produce proteins, which are oftentimes, not always, but often, are secreted into the media. So at the end of the day, you need to purify your protein from the media, and you don't need the cells. Um, and even, even when the proteins or whatever you're producing are inside the cells, you don't need the cells alive, you need them to be lysed or destroyed in order to release those proteins and purify them. But for cultivated meat, it's very different. We actually don't need the media, we need the cells and we rather have the cells intact instead of ruptured. So because of that, we definitely need fit for purpose equipment for cultivated meat, which uh, you know doesn't really exist. And if you look, uh, most companies say that they use continuous centrifuge, but then after that, you see the 
uh, other section. And so by other, what they mean is they either uh, modified the equipment that are typically used in biopharma or they had to design their own process. Uh, but you know, companies had a lot of questions and most of them are interested to see more fit for purpose harvesting uh, methods or equipment for cultivated meat. And remember another thing that is unique with cultivated meat um, is just the amount of media and cell culture that is needed. And so we definitely need a very efficient way to harvest the cells in huge quantities. All right, let's talk about bioreactor and scaling. So for people who may not have the technical background, there are two general types of scaling strategies. One of them is scaling up, one of them is scaling out. Scaling up means that you just increase the volume of your equipment. So for instance, you go from a 10 liter bioreactor to 100 to 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, et cetera. Um, obviously, the benefit of it is that the economics of scale kicks in. Um, so larger bioreactors would cost less per unit of uh, volume. And also, uh, you may need lower uh, capital uh, spend and um, the depreciation per unit is also lower. Um, but on the other hand, it could, uh, you know, you're going to have other challenges such as operational risks, because obviously in larger bioreactors, if you get contamination, for instance, or batch failure for whatever reason, then the entire batch is wasted. Um, another benefit of it is also that you have less batch to batch variation because everything is made in uh, one giant batch instead of multiple smaller units. On the other hand, we have scaling out, which is basically using bioreactors of the same size, but you just add more of them in series. Um, it definitely uh, mitigates the operational risk um, and it allows using single, single use bioreactors. Another benefit of scaling out is that it's good for a variety of products, especially if the products require some sort of scaffolding or cells require a uh, surface to attach to. Um, so definitely when it comes to choosing um, the strategy, cell type, final product, whether the process requires differentiation and all these factors uh, become uh, important. So when we ask about the scaling strategies uh, from cultivated meat companies, most of them say that they're trying to scale up. Um, some of them say that they're trying to scale out and a significant number say that they're using both methods. But remember that some of them are smaller companies. So by, by scaling up, what they could mean is they're trying to scale up from like really tiny R&D sizes to larger sizes, such as like 50 liters. So they may not mean scaling up for commodity or industrial scale, just to be clear. Um, but also due to the variety of cultivated meat products and cell types, it is also possible that uh, it, the industry will need both approaches either in combination or separately. What do I mean by that? So one approach could be that companies first scale up, let's say they scale up from uh, you know, pilot scale to uh, a couple of, thousands of liters or tens of thousands or maybe even 100,000 liter first and then a scale out from there. The other possible outcome could be that different scaling ap uh, approaches could be actually good for different products. So maybe for some products scaling up makes more sense and for others um, scaling out could, uh, could be better. Especially because if you scale out that means that you can for instance use hollow fiber bioreactors or certain type of bioreactors that could be better for certain products. Now regarding techno-economic assessment um, we ask whether companies have performed this um, analysis and most of them said that they have conducted techno-economic assessments, but most of them uh, don't want to publish that publicly. Um, uh, but some of them were kind enough to, to say that they would be open to share some of the data with GFI confidentially. But I really want to encourage you all to publish your TEAs because uh, that way we can evaluate them and find the gaps. And you know, one of the things we do at GFI is when we understand these gaps clearly, then we can direct uh, funding and grant to these uh, areas and fill those gaps, which what it means is that everyone can benefit from that. So as much as you can, please publish your results. Now, mode of operation is also a very important factor. 
um, and it can impact the efficiency and cost of cultivated meat production. And each mode of operation has its own advantages and disadvantages. Um, the reason it's really important is because the mode of operation can directly impact the media usage. Um, the, the more complex modes of operation may require additional equipment such as recycling and filtration units, which can either reduce the overall cost or in, increase the cost of uh, consumables. But for those of you who are not familiar with different modes of uh, operation, just because it's very important, I'm gonna take a minute and explain the most common ones. So the uh, one of the most common ones is just a batch. So in batch bioreactor, you have a bioreactor, you pour your media, you pour your cells, you let them grow until the uh, waste products accumulate and then the cell growth is inhibited and cells start dying. The second one is um, similar to batch, except that you're continuously adding fresh media as you are continuously harvesting the cells and removing the old media. So in this case, the cell density and the volume remains steady. The other one is fed batch. So in fed batch, you start with a smaller volume, but you keep adding fresh media as uh, the waste products accumulate. That way you actually allow cells to stay alive, um, stay alive longer. And lastly, there is a perfusion. So in perfusion, it's similar to uh, continuous, but if you remember in continuous, we actually continuously harvest the cells. With perfusion, we are continuously adding fresh media, continuously removing the old media, but we are retaining the cells back inside the bioreactor, which means that the cell density can increase over time. And everything that I said is uh, represented in this figure very nicely. So that's basically viable cell density um, and over time. So as you can see for batch, the uh, cell density peaks very quickly and then cells start dying because waste accumulates. Fed batch is a very similar pattern except that it's just more prolonged because you're adding fresh media. With continuous uh, mode of operation, as you can see, the cell density um, remains uh, steady because you're continuously harvesting cells. And with perfusion, you can see that you can achieve the highest cell density because uh, you're retaining cells back in the bioreactor as you're removing the waste. Now, the bioreactor mode of operation is very important in cultivated meat as it directly determines the amount of media that is needed. Um, again, this may not be too critical for biopharma, but for cultivated meat industry, it's a huge factor given the large quantities of media that we need for cultivated meat production. In uh, other words, the mode of operation can directly impact the cost of cultivated meat. Now, I highly recommend you guys to take a look at this techno-economic techno analysis done by Arc Biotech, which uh, basically explores the interconnectedness uh, of media cost versus bioreactor scale versus mode of operation. In this TEA, as you can see, the, if the cost of media is very low or the bioreactor volume is on the smaller side or relatively smaller, the continuous process could make more sense. For larger bioreactors or when the cost of media is relatively higher, fed batch may make more sense. Again, this may be forward looking, um, but nevertheless, we definitely need more TEAs like this, especially when they can easily show the interconnectedness of many different variables such as media cost, bioreactor scale, mode of operation, et cetera. So when we ask cultivated meat companies about the mode of operation they are using, as you can see, the most common one is fed batch, but there is not a significant difference in the mode of operation that they're using. Please note that the companies could have different bioreactors for R&D or uh, for uh, production. And they may have chosen multiple answers and these bioreactors could have different mo modes of operation. Um, in any case, I really want to emphasize that the cost and design of bioreactor media and filtration and recycling devices, uh, all of them are really interconnected and these areas need to be advanced collaboratively. Um, here at GFI, I was talking to an engineer who built uh, bioreactors and he was very excited. He said, you know, I have a very great design, et cetera. And I asked a few questions about the media usage. And what he said was 
um, hey, I don't really care about media. That's not my problem. But I think it's everybody's problem. So um, I definitely encourage manufacturers and uh, companies who do research on bioreactors uh, to consider all these factors at the same time. Um, so media usage, the filtration and recycling devices, um, and everything else. So bioreactor type is also very important. And there are different types of bioreactors that could be suitable for different uh, processes, depending on the cell type, uh, production scale, and other factors. Um, so uh, there are three types of bioreactors that we typically see for cultivated meat. One of them is hollow fiber bioreactors, which is basically uh, a vessel with a bunch of tubes or fibers, if you will. And the media passes through these fibers and delivers nutrients and oxygen to the cells. And the cells can actually uh, basically grow in the areas between these fibers uh, or attached to them even. Um, so these are really good for cells that require uh, scaffolding or a surface to attach to or to differentiate. Uh, the other common type of bioreactor is a stair tank, which as the name suggests, it's basically a tank with a stirrer. Um, the, uh, in general, the, one of the, I guess, challenges with stir tank bioreactor is that if you want to scale it up, um, the mixing could be, or agitation could be uh, a challenge because you want to make sure that you mix really well to deliver oxygen and nutrients. Uh, at the same time, you don't want to mix too fast that because of the shear stress, you start um, damaging the cells. Uh, the last bioreactor we're going to talk about is airlift, which is very similar to stir tank, except that instead of a stirrer, it uses the upward flow of gas to circulate and mix the media. Um, it's relatively simple in design and it has fewer moving parts. So because of that, it could be uh, more cost effective and it could uh, have a lower contamination risk. Um, in general, it's also a, a better solution in terms of shear stress because you don't have a, a mixer or a stirrer, uh, but you have to also remember that when the bubbles burst, they can still uh, uh, put some stress on cells. So when we ask cultivated meat companies about what type of bioreactor they are using, um, uh, most of them said that they use stir tank bioreactors. But why is that? Um, I think one reason for that is because uh, early on, cultivated meat companies were under pressure to really reach market as fast as possible. And if you look around and if you go bioreactor shopping, um, uh, you know, most of the bioreactors, almost all of them are meant for uh, biopharma or, you know, for food production, which is like fermentation, not necessarily cultivated meat, right? So I think part of it is because we borrowed a lot of technology from uh, biopharma. So what it means is that there is definitely uh, other areas that have not been explored and there is a need for performing more techno-economic analysis to understand the potential of other types of bioreactor. Um, so we do encourage other companies to do the same. And here at GFI, we're actually right now running an analysis uh, with an industry partner to understand the potential for airlift and uh, hollow fiber bioreactors compared to the more common stir tank bioreactors. So um, another good indicator of cultivated, cultivated meat growth is the bioreactor size. And here at GFI, we are actually very interested in tracking these numbers because we think that they can sort of show the overall trend in cultivated meat uh, production scale. Now, as we expected, uh, cultivated meat production currently relies on bioreactors in low thousand liter range. Now, regardless of scaling up or scaling out, I think that cultivated meat uh, industry needs larger bioreactors ranging from several, several thousands to tens or even hundreds of thousands of liters first. So, no matter what the scaling strategy is, I think many companies still have to scale up first um, and then decide whether they want to scale out from there or keep scaling up. And in this graph, we actually excluded smaller vessels uh, that are used for R&D, but uh, some companies still chose that. And I think that's due to smaller vessels or bioreactors that they use during seed train um, process. So that's basically scaling up 
um, from smaller scale to larger scale production during the production process. So not for R&D. Now, originally cultivated meat companies used a lot of pricey biomedical grade media, but they're increasingly interested in more affordable and scalable food grade options. They're also interested in building fit for purpose equipment such as bioreactors. Uh, bioreactors in biopharma, um, they're really built to withstand uh, extreme conditions that are required for sterilization. So two type of uh, sterilization techniques are called uh, CIP or SIP or you know, clean in place or sterilization in place. And what it means is that they require harsh chemical treatment or high temperatures or pressures, but they may not necessarily be required for food production. In our survey, um, one reason companies said that they're using uh, high quality pharma grade stuff instead of uh, food grade material is because they believe similar, good, uh, similar food grade options uh, don't really exist. So we do encourage suppliers and manufacturers to develop fit for purpose material and equipment and borrow technology and ideas from food and beverage industries. That way we can reduce the cost while ensuring the safety of the process. Another challenge that we uh, identified in talking with uh, industry partners is there is not a clear distinction between food grade and pharma grade. Um, and a lot of times they're actually used, uh, they're, uh, they're basically built with same material, except that they go through different certification process. And that's really what makes them uh, more expensive. Um, and just to bring it back to these filters, a lot of times the material that is used in this one and larger bioreactor, uh, larger filtration units or capsules uh, it's very similar, except that the, again, certification and specifications are different. Um, this is why uh, creating standards for cultivated meat can really guide equipment makers to produce cost-effective options. And in this case, collaboration is really essential. Now, to be a little more specific, we ask cultivated meat companies about the types of material uh, that uh, were used in their bioreactors. Um, from larger scale stainless steel bioreactors, companies use uh, basically two common alloys. One of them is um, 304 and the other is 316. So they're both used in biopharma or um, food industries. But what's the difference? They're actually pretty similar except that 316 is more expensive because it's more durable and it's more resilient to uh, corrosion. And it's better if you're using harsh chemical treatment all the time. But 304 already is used in industry as well. And uh, while it's not as durable as 316, it still works and it's 40% cheaper to produce. Not the bioreactor as a whole, but the, the stainless steel material. So this emphasizes the importance of developing or using other sterilization methods that can also eliminate uh, the need for uh, harsh chemical treatment. So basically if you have better uh, uh, sterilization techniques that don't require harsh material, then that opens doors um, for using other cheaper materials to build bioreactors. But there's also more R&D uh, needed to replace pharma grade material and equipment with more affordable um, food grade uh, products as much as possible. So towards the end of the survey, um, uh, we asked a couple of questions about uh, basically challenges that companies are facing. And part of the reason we did the survey was we really wanted to understand the bottlenecks better and um, also inform the industry and suppliers so that they can be prepared. Um, in one question, we asked companies that um, among options that are available, so not things that need to be further developed in the future, what are the most limiting factors in terms of cost and availability? And as you can see, growth factors and um, talent availability, um, they're on top. So uh, we're gonna talk about growth factors a little more, but uh, in terms of talent availability, that's something that we are very passionate about in GFI. Um, and our previous results showed that um, uh, for cultivated meat industry specifically, um, people with background in food or meat science, um, people with skills to operate bioreactors 
and process development scientists, these are um, in high demand. So um, here at GFI, we're very interested in building a pipeline to really train the next generation of um, uh, talents and skill, skilled workers. So if you're interested in that, please contact me and I will put you in touch with another department at GFI. Um, but the take home message here is that uh, suppliers should be really prepared uh, for potentially high demand of growth factors and media components, as well as other equipments and material that are listed uh, in this figure. In another question, we asked companies that if there was one thing they wanted to see cost reduction for most urgently, what would that be? And again, we have the cost of recombinant proteins and growth factors first, followed by the cost of um, bioreactor and media, um, uh, basal media. And um, we think that there is definitely a good opportunity here for suppliers and startups to ensure that recombinant proteins and bioreactors are available at a reasonable price and quantity. And I say quantity because it is more than clear that there's gonna be a high demand for uh, growth factors or um, media components in the coming years. So we really want to make sure that suppliers are prepared to meet the demand. Now, in terms of bioreactor uh, price specifically with limited data, and I can't emphasize this enough with limited data, so only six respondents uh, actually shared this information with us. Um, the trend suggests that on average, um, uh, bioreactors cost something like $100,000 per 100 liter of bioreactor capacity. But of course, with larger bioreactors, uh, economics of scale become a factor and they can actually cost almost 50% uh, less. And I do want to also share another experience. I was running a mass spec facility in one of the com companies I worked at and we were purchasing a mass spec and the, the instrument, when they quoted us, this is one of the large uh, pharmaceutical, uh, or I guess, bioscience uh, companies. What they quoted us was uh, $1 million. But after discount, they gave us like 50% discount and we bought it for like 500,000. So that just tells you how ridiculously some of these uh, equipments um, are priced and um, why there is a significant need to really just reduce the price and uh, produce fit for purpose equipment for cultivated meat. So let's talk about the cultivated meat market a little bit. We asked the, the companies about the, uh, we asked them at what production scale they think that they can reach either prosperity or they think that their products would be uh, viable uh, commercially and they, they can you know, compete with conventional products. They said that, again, these are not estimates by GFI. Uh, this is what they said. Uh, what they think is that high value items like unagi or foie gras should become cost competitive uh, when produced in tons. Um, some mentioned that seafood like um, tuna or salmon will likely become competitive at kiloton scale. With hybrid products with lower cell count, again, uh, in the order of tons. And lastly, common products like beef burgers are projected to reach price parity when produced in tens of kilotons per year. But companies also said that the scale is not the only factor that plays a role. They thought that having a resilient and adequate supply chain is also extremely important. So hashtag suppliers here. They also said that lowering the cost of media by reducing the cost of base on media and using viable uh, growth factor substitutes is another area that can impact the time that it, can, that it takes to reach uh, price parity. So we also ask about the top markets that cultivated meat companies are interested in or they want to get regulatory approvals at. And as you can see, US and Singapore uh, comes on top. There is a, definitely an opportunity here for companies, academia and nonprofits uh, to work with the government and provide educational um, materials and just basically provide education and build a road, roadmap to uh, obtain regulatory approval. Um, and we also asked cultivated meat companies about their understanding of regulatory process 
uh, in their top market. And most of them said that their understanding is sort of sufficient, but many of them said that there are gaps in their knowledge or then their knowledge is uh, completely lacking in those markets. Um, so these results really suggest that cultivated meat industry should work with regulators and other stakeholders and help them to really understand the safety and production process, because we think if we do that, then obtaining regulatory approvals uh, would be a lot more smooth. And finally, here are some of the, uh, the summary of some of our recommendations. For, for the full list, please uh, go to the full report that we'll publish soon. But um, so our recommendation to suppliers and manufacturers is that uh, to make media and major equipment more um, available and affordable. And when we say media, we mean both basal media and the media components that growth factors. And overall, there is a need for developing fit for purpose equipment, especially by reactors and major, uh, other major equipment such as centrifuges. And on top of that, other consumable, expensive consumables such as filtration units. Uh, to refresh your memory, if we have cheaper and more affordable filtration units or recycling uh, equipment, uh, what they can allow is to use other types of modes of uh, operation or other things that are not an option, not a viable option right now because all the consumables are so expensive. So um, again, fit for purpose equipment for not just bioreactors, but all the consumables as well. Um, one area suppliers can be uh, focus, uh, can focus on is incorporating food grade material to lower the cost as much as possible. And one example that we covered was using different types of alloys of stainless steel. And suppliers should also ensure that their products pass adequate quality control to minimize batch failure due to defective products and raw material contamination. And this is again, something I have personal experience with and I have heard people in cultivated meat industry uh, complaining about losing a batch just because of, you know, defective bioreactor bag or raw material contamination. Um, frankly, we can't afford that. So our main recommendation for R&D teams um, is to develop affordable and effective growth factors and media components. We also recommend developing um, better metabolic models to optimize media. Um, in addition to automate, automating the bioprocessing, such as cell separation or filtration processes. Um, another potential high impact topic is researching the sources of contamination and how to prevent them. And like we talked about, uh, developing alternative, alternatives to um, antibiotics. Lastly, achieving desired taste and texture is something that came up as a challenge several times during the survey. Um, just want to touch base on the metabolic models. Uh, you can actually uh, study cells and understand what they need to grow um, um, optimally. And with these models, you can fine tune the media and that way you can actually reduce the cost of media uh, uh, faster. And you can also design media uh, that are better for cell growth. So they're more efficient and more effective. So very important topic. And I mentioned automation as well. Another thing that could become a bottleneck in the future is uh, just the high cost of running bioreactors and automation could be a good way to uh, mitigate those uh, challenges. Um, and for whoever who is on this call with uh, background in computer sciences and computational biology, please definitely check CMMC or Cultivated Meat uh, Modeling uh, Consortium to learn more about how you can use your skills to model and uh, simulate the bioprocessing for cultivated meat. And as you can imagine, you can't really test every single parameter in large scale. It's gonna be timely, uh, time consuming and very expensive. So having these models can really help uh, to accelerate the growth of cultivated meat industry. And automation, again, I wanna emphasize on this because we learned that talent availability is a problem, especially people who can operate bioreactors and automation could be a good way to both uh, reduce the risk of error, human error, um, as well as making the process simpler, so less, uh, uh, so relying less on operators. And lastly, our um, 
recommendation to investors is to support pretty much everything that I just mentioned, particularly in areas related to cost reduction and developing better media components and fit for purpose equipment. We do also encourage supporting simulation and modeling um, attempts uh, for the reason that I just mentioned. So with that, uh, well, that was almost an hour. Um, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, please ask ChatGPT. I'm no, just kidding, you can ask us. Uh, I hope I wasn't on mute or something because I wasn't really paying attention to chats. Thanks, Faraz. Um, yeah, we can move to the to the Q and A portion now, and there are a lot of uh, questions. But I will I will give you a breather and answer the first uh, few on my on my own, so you can um, sort of just take a, a moment. So one of the questions was about um, if non renewable energy sources um, were or are cheaper, is there a benefit? To cultivated meat companies using them in early stages to save on costs. Um, so I think, you know, it, it could be somewhat, I mean, if you're assuming that the non-renewable sources of the existing sources are, are cheaper, then, you know, it, it could presumably save on, on costs, but utilities costs aren't expected to be like a major cost driver in the short term either. So I don't know how big of a difference that would really make. Obviously, as more renewable energy comes online and grids get greener, over time, that will sort of coincide with the scale up of the industry where utilities, you know, you're using more energy at, at larger facilities, et cetera. So it might matter more. Um, but in general, you know, installation of things like solar these days is tends to be more affordable than, um, you know, existing fossil fuels. And that, that trend may, may continue. Um, uh, by the way, I'm Elliot and I've worked with Faraz on this, on this report. Um, so another question is, is there any other information you can share on the study you mentioned that GFI is sponsoring, studying alternative bioreactors like airlift and hollow fiber? So we can't share too much uh, more about that right now. Um, we might be you know, reaching out to companies in the industry um, throughout the, the study process. Um, so just all I can say is uh, you know, TBD. And if you're a company, uh, you know, check your email inbox if, if we do reach out. And for us, the last one I'll answer before turning over some questions to you is what uh, find, what grant opportunities are offered for groups working on developing solutions for bioreactors? Um, so this is a great, great question. Obviously, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, R&D to be done with respect to different bioreactors using the cells that are being used in this industry, you know, even exploring novel designs. Um, I can't tell you any specific opportunities that are out there, but GFI does have a, a funding database that we, we track, a, you know, global funding opportunities. So if there's something in there that catches your eye, there might be some uh, applicable um, opportunities related to bioreactor or, or scale up and process design. Awesome. All right, uh, Faraz. Um, so I got, uh, I will read off some questions for you. Um, so the first question was, um, when you're talking about contamination, uh, how do you control contamination at the entry point for media if food grade ingredients are used? So I think the way to think about this is even when it's pharma grade, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily a sterile um, or um, it doesn't require sterilization. So that's not true at all. Uh, for instance, to make buffer or, or the solution that you use to you know, clean the system or whatever, uh, the media components oftentimes, so none of them comes sterile for the most part. You have to dissolve them in water. And once, you, once you're done with your media production, then you use the same exact filters that I just showed you to sterilize it. So even when it's pharma grade, um, you still have to go through the same process anyways. Um, so I hope that explains the question. Great. Um, another question that came in is, how are people using single cell suspension to expand cells that might require attachment like Anchorage dependent cells? Cells can generally be adopted, uh, adapted to different conditions, but also the other, I guess, if they really require attachment, then I guess there are a few ways to go about it. It's either grow, growing in aggregates, so cells start aggregating, or you use microcarrier. So you're still using suspension, but you're sort of providing a, uh, a, a surface for cells to attach. Um, but cells also can be adapted to uh, suspension, but I don't know if 
Elliot has more to say about that. Yeah, I think, you know, with muscle cells, they tend to be adherent. And so, I mean, we don't really have the granularity of, of data on terms of, you know, success rates for adapting, let's say, muscle cells um, or other adherent cells to uh, single cell suspension. I think, as Faraz mentioned, there might be some, you know, sort of ways that you can force a cell to, to do that. Um, and that might have higher success rates in, in different cell types and different species. But at, at this point, we don't uh, fully understand or have the granularity of, of data to, to give a robust answer, I think. Um, okay, so another question, when talking to, when you were talking about modes of operation, um, there was a question about, can you, what about fill and draw modes that reduces cleaning and SIP cycles, as well as seed train operations? So I guess uh, if you have any thoughts on other other ways that you can, let's say, configure your process to, you know, decrease costs or increase, um, you know, other parameters. I think that could definitely be considered for sure as another way to run bioreactors. And you're absolutely right. We think that these uh, options should be explored and we don't think that there is enough exploration happening and oftentimes um, I think the problem is that with pharma, everything is so, so if you want to produce a protein, for instance, in pharma, everything is pretty set for you. You, you are not developing new ways of doing things. There are maybe two or three types of cells that you would, you would be using, but for cultivated meat, it's just so, it's all over the place. And you're absolutely right. I think these are other things that we have to explore, but I do think that fill and draw could uh, definitely reduce the, the cost. Uh, assuming that there is a good connection between how you do this, uh, but making sure that the sterilization sterilis uh, is maintained, and there is a good harvesting process that could um, attach to your system. Because if you fill, it, uh, uh, fill and draw, you just have to make sure that the sterilization is not uh, compromised, um, because if you are recycling the process. But if you do, th do this only once, then even if the you know, bioreactors, sterilization is compromised, then that, that is okay because that's the end of process. But if you're repeating the cycle, so I think that becomes a challenge, but I don't think it's something that cannot be solved. Thanks. Um, yeah, switching gears, um, another question about talent development um, and how much education do you think would be expected to, you know, operate these facilities or, or, you know, be a worker in the, in these facilities. Could you envision like a two-year diploma course? Are there hands-on training for high school and education or, or GED students? What, what sort of options might you envision uh, being successful? <laughs> That's actually a great question. And absolutely. I think um, in order to operate as a manufacturing uh, staff member, um, you don't really need uh, higher education. And in fact, when it comes to really operating any of these devices and equipment, you don't learn them in academia, even if you have 10 PhDs, you just don't learn process development. These are just not things that one would learn in academia at all. So at the end of the day, you have to learn it um, on the job. And um, some of the best people that I've seen in manufacturing, they already they, they just had like an associate degree in biotechnology. So either that or masters. Um, but funny enough, um, our company specifically did not hire any PhDs for their manufacturing, except the head of manufacturing, no one else, because they actually didn't want PhDs. They wanted someone who could learn a protocol and follow those protocols without, you know, I think in their experience, PhDs always came up with a, you know, a new way to do things. And that's something you don't want in manufacturing. You want that in R&D, but not manufacturing. So to answer your question, you don't actually need a lot of education. Um, uh, the training could be done uh, in a, throughout the course or a workshop or just like an associate degree. And I, I dropped um, an, a link to, there's a, there's a, um, Manufacturing Institute called Army um, that's funded by the government and they try to make a industry out of cells, tissues and organs, mostly for regenerative medicine, but they're also interested in cultured meat. And they have a lot of workforce development programs, including an apprenticeship pro program where you get hands on training. Uh, and then the goal is that you you go and work for some of these companies that are doing regenerative medicine. And so I think 
a lot of those hands-on skills are, are quite applicable to uh, cultured meat as well. Um, and so we expect that, you know, there's, there'll be overlap in these programs in terms of, um, you know, creating talent that will uh, feed, feed both of these growing industries, whether it's, you know, cell therapeutics or, or cultured meat. Um, okay, so some other questions that are sort of scattered um, and maybe harder to answer. You, you asked, uh, when you're discussing bioreactor cost data, um, was the type of the bioreactor identified um, by companies and specifically interested in if those costs that were shown refer to uh, single use bags or whether they're stainless steel vessels? I believe they were all the stainless steel based on the sizes of bioreactors that they mentioned. Um, so um, I'll be happy to double check with the raw data, but I'm pretty sure they were all uh, stainless steel, just based on the size. And I could also see what they were using. Um, yeah, there's still it's still limited data there. I think so. You know, we definitely want to get better um, cost cost data from from bioreactor manufacturers as as we move forward. Um, this is another question around co um, cold manufacturers. So, do CDMOs have any openness to running cult cultivated meat cell cultures in facilities that are typically biopharma? Um. Yeah, I think you, you would be good to chip in, but what I would say is definitely there are CDMO uh, facilities that you know previously were meant for um, cultivated meat. And given the fact that a lot of things that we are using already are from pharma, unfortunately, uh, I think some, some of them are definitely open, but something that was actually on my last slide, there's also a possibility to build uh, CDMOs that are specifically for cultivated meat. That way it's, um, it's a facility that can be shared amongst a couple of companies um, and it's more targeted towards CDMO, but it is definitely possible to use pharma facilities for, for this. It's not good in my opinion, but it's, I, I think it's definitely possible. Yeah, I think you know, we've talked to some folks that, you know, with with the explosion in, in vaccines due to, to, due to COVID, um, you know, there was a lot of infrastructure that was built around the world to to upscale that. And some of those assets, you know, have become stranded. And so I think, you know, you have all this, you know, everything you need and from a cell culture perspective, you have a lot of equipment there. And so some people are indeed looking at turning in, you know, vaccine production facilities into cultivated meat CDMOs, um, especially if you have the personnel, you know, that live around that facility and have worked in that facility and, and have the skills uh, then it's a you know fairly relatively easy one to one swap. Um, I think so. Yeah, I, I think there there is that potential that we've we've seen talking to people, and we'll we'll see how that plays out over over time. Um, uh, there's a question around if you assume you have the same cell line, what are comparisons and titers with respect to four major types of, of bioreactors? Um, so I guess that's referring to you know, stirred tank, what types of titers might you expect or differences in titers between different bioreactor types? Um, yeah, so titer is generally a word that we use for protein production. So um, that would be the concentration of the protein or whatever cells are producing. I think a better terminology would be the cell density or the number of cells per ml of or per volume of media that you need. You need. And um, uh, we'll send you the slide. So there was a slide that I showed you. So um, <clears throat> do you say what type of bioreactor, what modes of operation, what types of bioreactor? Um, um, hollow fiber sometimes can achieve uh, really high cell densities. Um, um, I think it really also depends on the scale and um, uh, the mode of operation. So I couldn't really tell you stair tank with you know different modes of operation could yield different yields. Um, but maybe you can find the cell densities that are presented in different types of bioreactor helpful for that. Yeah, I think there'll be different limiting factors and different uh, reactor types. And so it's, it's hard to give exact numbers. Um, there's a question around um, scaffolding. So, don't see a lot of information on successful scaffolds or scaffold materials for cell ag. Have you seen 
what works? Are companies ignoring scaffolds? What what are the sort of uptake that we're seeing with scaffolding? Um, good question. We did actually ask more questions about that. I just um, didn't put them in the presentation to save time. So I definitely encourage you to read the full report, but uh, we do have a section on the scaffolds. Um, but uh, we ask about the types of scaffolds that companies are using, uh, polymer spinning, hydrogels, 3D printing. So uh, that's the order of uh, what companies are using. So assuming they had success with that, so. Yeah, so we, we did ask a lot of questions around differentiation and scaffold that just wasn't presented here today, but there will be uh, sections of the main report that, that dive into that a little further. But, uh, you know, suffice to say, scaffolds are being used in, in the industry um, to, to varying different degrees. Um, and of course, probably dependent on the, the product that people are trying to make. I just had a um, quick comment about scaffolding very quick. Um, when we ask about the importance or challenges that companies have, scaffolding was actually towards the end, so not that urgent. Uh, but that also, I just want to caution people to understand that because it's not a bottleneck right now or it's not a huge challenge, it doesn't mean that it won't be. I think it just means that the priority right now is just scaling up. But once we are at large scales, I bet that uh, finding scalable and affordable uh, scaffolding will become a bottleneck um, at that point. So we definitely need to be working on that um, before it's too late. All right, a few more questions. Um, is there any experience with horizontal reactors rather than vertical reactors? Um, just considering cell damage because of water column pressure, pressure changes in, in large uh, bioreactors as you increase in, in scale. Um, yeah, I guess uh, when they were scaling up to hundreds of uh, thousands of liter, it doesn't always mean that they're just going up, they could also go Horizontally, so you're absolutely right. In very tall bioreactors, the water pressure would definitely go um, very high. So um, yes, that aspect ratio of bioreactor in terms of high height to uh, width is certainly something that is very important. Um, and I don't have the actual numbers for you, but I would say that uh, definitely for scaling up past certain amounts, then you just have to uh, increase the diameter as well. Yeah, I'll just add, I think Eduardo, you asked this question if you're still on the line. I, I've heard people talk about like bioreactors in the shape of like a donut that's like, you know, not like that's flat, but it's not like vertical. I have no idea um, about like any other sort of horizontal designs, um, but something that, you know, people might explore from a maybe a CFD perspective. Um, all right, is there any merit to explore pre-pilot or pilot scale reactors constructed of plastics that are non-single use? I personally believe so. Um, but I also think that, I mean, I really hope that in the near future, we also see bioreactors that are larger made with certain types of plastic perhaps. Um, and, while the material of the bioreactor is important, I think the more important factors are um, the, uh, the dimension of the bioreactor, the propeller, the mixing rate, the uh, aeration, and all those factors. And assuming that those factors are the same, um, I believe that if that's what allows someone to do those studies, I think that's still valuable, but um, maybe- a yeah, I think- reactor manufacturer would be better to comment on that. Yeah, and I think as, as was mentioned when you're talking about sterilization and, and things like that, you know, maybe if, if you use, you know, non-pressure, you don't require pressure treated vessel, then, then maybe you could have different types of plastics actually make up the, the bioreactor. So I think something to explore for sure. Um, all right, another question on likelihood of uh, growth media composed of agricultural commodities like hydrolysates. Um, so I'll just, I'll chime in and say that you know, I talked about this at length in a webinar last week on cost drivers of cultivated meat. Um, so I'd recommend watching that or, or at least going through the slides. 
this is obviously a big area of, of interest for the field um, and also for GFI. So I think we'll be looking into amino acid supply chain in future analyses. Um, and uh, there might be some funding opportunities that are related to that um, in, the, in the future as well. Um, all right, lastly, could the speakers comment further on scale up? Given the slow uh, growth rate of animal cells, it appears a straightforward design exercise to scale up animal bioreactors to let's say hundreds of thousands of working volume due to ability to meet peak oxygen uptake rate, temperature control, and homogenization of growth. So I, I guess this is just saying, um, you know, how difficult is, is, is scale up uh, overall? Yeah, uh, so if, if that's the gist of the question. What's that? I, I don't, I'm not sure if the question's phrased correctly, but I think it's trying to ask about, you know, oh, yeah. all okay. these different considerations. Yeah, everything that you mentioned is actually a challenge when you scale up, um, such as um, the homogenization, um, you mentioned temperature control, the um, oxygenation. So a lot of these factors become serious challenges. And also the sheer stress that you put put into cells by by mixing. It doesn't mean that we can't achieve it, um, but those are definitely so. It's it's definitely not straightforward. So you can't just scale up everything and um, expect everything to work. All right. Well, thanks for sticking around, everyone. Uh, any last final words from you for us? I'm just very excited to see so much interest in cultivated meat, and uh, just want to say. Um, if you are working on this, if you're donating to GFI um, or whatever, if you're interested in this and want to switch careers or whatever, thank you. It's one of the best things that you can be doing for the world. So thanks for sticking around.